Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today, I'm super excited to show you a portfolio website that we will create entirely from scratch using HTML and CSS. This project is perfect for beginners and a great way to learn and practice essential HTML and CSS skills. Whether you're just starting out or looking to refresh your basics, this project will cover it all. So, let's dive right in and explore what we'll be building. This portfolio site has everything you'd expect in a professional portfolio. We've got a stylish navigation bar, a welcoming home section with a profile image and call to action buttons, a sleek about section, a list of skills displayed in an eye-catching layout, and a projects gallery to showcase our recent work. There's also a services section to highlight what we offer, an experience section to show job history, and a contact form for visitors to reach out, plus, a polished footer to tie everything together. We'll cover a lot in this tutorial, but here are some of the highlights. Building the layout. I'll guide you through creating each section's HTML structure, from the navbar and main profile area to individual sections like projects, services, experience, and contact. Using icons and images. We integrate images and icons to bring life to the page, using the Remix icon library for that polished, modern look. You'll learn how to link to an external icon library, choose the right icons, and add images seamlessly into your layout. Stylish CSS effects. With CSS, we'll be styling each section to make it responsive and visually appealing. We'll add background colors, style buttons, and create a custom fancy gradient that you'll see across the site. Plus, you'll learn techniques for adjusting text, using padding and margins, and applying CSS variables to make styling easy, and consistent. Responsive Design Principles This portfolio is fully responsive. I'll show you how to create layouts that look great on both desktop and mobile screens by using relative units, flexbox, and media queries. By the end, you'll know how to make your design adjust to any screen size. By the end of this tutorial, you'll have a professional-looking portfolio to showcase your work, with clean, well-organized code and a solid understanding of the building blocks of web development. Let's jump right in and start coding. As usual, I have an images folder prepared. This folder contains all the images we use throughout the project. If you'd like to follow along, you can download the folder for free from the first link in the description. Once you've got the images folder, start by creating a project folder and feel free to name it whatever you like. Next, Move the images folder into your project folder so it's ready to use. When you open your project folder, it should contain the images folder, and now we're all set to move forward. Let's open our project folder in VS Code. For this project, we'll only need two files, an HTML file, and a CSS file. In the HTML file, let's start by generating the basic structure using an exclamation mark shortcut. Then, give your project a title. And just above the title, we'll add a link to our CSS file. Placing it anywhere in the head section works fine. We'll also add a favicon by typing link and selecting favicon. This favicon image is stored in the images folder under the name favicon. Before diving into the main project work, let me quickly show you some helpful extensions I use. These aren't strictly necessary, but they're useful tools that can enhance efficiency. My essentials include the HTML to CSS autocompletion extension, which suggests class and ID names for CSS, and Live Server, which launches a local live reload server for a seamless development experience. Using the Live Server extension, let's launch our project in a browser. Right now, it's blank, 
but we'll be adding elements soon. As I mentioned, we'll be using external icons, so in a new tab, head over to remixicon.com. Select the GitHub logo to access the GitHub repository, then scroll down to locate the CDN link, and copy the provided code. This code allows us to include the icons, go ahead and paste it into the head section of your HTML file. Next, let's add a font. Open fonts.google.com in your browser and search for Zine. Once found, click Get Font, then select Embed Code. Under the At Import section, copy the part of the code we'll need, as we'll be placing this in the CSS file instead of the HTML. Paste it into your CSS, and let's add a quick comment indicating it's a Google Font link for easy reference. With the font set, we'll move on to defining our variables. In CSS, variables allow us to set a value once, give it a name, and then reuse that name wherever needed. Think of a variable as a shorthand or label for a value you plan to use frequently. For instance, if you have a specific color you want to apply across different parts of a project, you can store that color as a variable instead of rewriting it each time. This way, if you later decide to adjust the color, you only need to change the variable, and every place where it's used will automatically update. Variables make your code cleaner, easier to maintain, and highly efficient when making adjustments. The root selector targets the very top level of our document. This means that any variable we define here will be accessible from anywhere in our CSS. We'll start by declaring the main color properties. You'll notice each variable starts with two hyphens, which is how CSS recognizes it as a custom property. We define hue as 270. This is a base value we use to create related colors using the HSL color model. HSL stands for hue, saturation, and lightness, and allows us to easily adjust the color's brightness and tone. Here, the hue of 270 gives us a purplish shade, but we can use this single value across multiple variables to keep our color scheme cohesive. Next, let's define our primary colors using the HSL, starting with main color. We reference our hue variable inside the HSL function, which allows us to use its value for consistency across our color scheme. This color has an 80% saturation, giving it vibrancy, and a 49% lightness, offering balanced brightness. For accent color, we use the same hue but adjust the saturation and lightness slightly, creating a darker tone than our main color. This color works well for elements like buttons or icons where a subtle contrast is needed. Moving to light color, this is nearly white, while dark color is almost black. Both are essential for adding contrast between text and backgrounds, promoting readability and visual balance. For text color, we apply a low saturation of 2%, giving it a neutral appearance, and a lightness of 66%, resulting in a comfortable, slightly darker shade that's easy on the eyes. We then set background color to be nearly black, but with a hint of our hue variable for added depth. For card BG color, we use 10% lightness to make it just a touch lighter than the background, creating a subtle contrast that allows cards to stand out gently. Lastly, theme gradient is defined as a conic gradient, creating a circular color gradient. Here's how it works. From 150 degrees at 50%, 45% sets the gradient starting angle and origin point, so it starts at 150 degrees around the center of the element. Each color stop, at 0 degrees, 140 degrees, and 360 degrees, defines where each color begins to blend, transitioning between darker and lighter shades of our primary hue to produce a dynamic, radial effect. And that covers our color variables, setting a cohesive and adaptable color scheme for our design. Alright, 
Let's dive into the font variables setup, by first understanding the relationship between rem and pixels. In CSS, one rem equals 16 pixels. So, when we set a value to two rem, it translates to 32 pixels. Using rem allows our text to be flexible and responsive to different screen sizes and user settings, while pixels are fixed and can pose accessibility challenges. Now, we'll go through our font variables to understand how we create a consistent look for our text. First, we define our main font family as Zine, with sans serif as a fallback option. The rest of the other font sizes is listed, feel free to note them down, and I'll explain them as we proceed. Next, we set up the font weights, which determine the thickness of the text. We will use three weights, regular, medium, and semi-bold. Finally, we have the z-index variables. The z-tooltip variable ensures that tooltips appear above other elements, while z-fixed is used for elements like headers or modals, keeping them visible on top of other content when necessary. Continuing with responsive typography, we're setting up our text to look great across various screen sizes. Here, we add a media query that activates once the screen width reaches 1168 pixels or wider. This isn't a variable, so we'll place it outside the CSS variable definitions. These updated font size values adjust automatically for larger screens, enhancing readability and ensuring consistent styling across devices. Next, we apply some foundational styles to ensure consistency across the page. Starting with the universal selector, we're targeting all elements to set box, sizing to border box. This way, padding and border widths are included in an element's total width and height, helping us control layouts more precisely. We also set padding and margin to zero here, removing any default spacing so we can define it later on. Moving to the HTML element, we set scroll behavior to smooth. This creates a smooth scrolling effect whenever anchor links are clicked, enhancing the user experience. For the body styling, which also applies to input, text area, and button elements, we set font family to the variable body font. Remember, we've customized body font to use Zine as the main font. With sans serif as a fallback, allowing for easy, site-wide font updates just by changing this variable. Similarly, we set the font size using the variable normal font size. Since this variable is in rems, currently at 0.938 rem, it adapts well to different screen sizes, ensuring readability across devices. For input, button, and text area fields, we set both border and outline to none. From heading 1 to heading 4, we're setting the color to light color variable, which pulls from our custom variables to ensure a consistent, bright color across all headings. We also set the font weight to the variable semi-bold font, giving the headings a bold look without being too heavy. For unordered lists, we remove the default bullet points by setting list style to none. Moving to anchor tags, setting text decoration to none removes the underline typically seen on links. Finally, let's adjust the styling for images. Setting display, to block removes any extra spacing around images. We also set maximum width to 100%, and height to auto, ensuring images remain responsive, scaling nicely within their containers without distortion. Continuing with our reusable CSS classes, let's start with the container class. Here, we set a maximum width of 1168 pixels to keep content centered and neatly contained, preventing it from stretching too wide on larger screens. We apply a margin inline of 1.5 rem, adding equal space on both sides to maintain a clean, centered layout without additional padding. Next, we define the grid class with display, grid, creating a flexible grid layout. By setting a gap of 1.5 rem, we ensure consistent placing between grid items, 
which helps with readability and balance. For the sections, we add vertical padding using padding block. The first value, 2 rem, applies to the top, and the second, 3 rem, to the bottom. This gives each section a balanced, spacious feel for a natural flow through the layout. Moving to the section title, we set the font size to the H2 font size variable, which keeps the text responsive and consistent. The text is centered with text align, center, and a margin bottom of 2 rem adds space below, helping separate the title from the content that follows. Lastly, the main class uses overflow, hidden, which clips any content extending beyond its boundaries. This is particularly useful for layouts with expanding elements, keeping them contained within the section. These classes provide a simple, cohesive layout structure that can be reused across various sections for a unified design. With the initial setup complete, we're ready to dive into the core of the project. Right away, we'll start by adding a navigation section with the class nav inside the body. Inside this nav, we'll add an unordered list with the class nav list. In this list, we'll create a list item that contains a link with the class nav link. This link will point to an anchor with the ID home and have a title attribute displaying home on hover. Since we want this link to contain an icon, Let's go over to Remix icon to find one. But first, we need to set up a background and text color in our CSS. For the body, set the background color to the one defined in our variables. And set the text color to the light color. Now that the colors are set, let's head to Remix icon, to search for a home icon. I've found one I like, so I'll copy it and paste it into the HTML. Checking in the browser, we can see the icon, I'll zoom in so it's clearly visible. Next, we'll need 5 menu items in total. Let's make 4 more copies of this list item. The second item will point to projects with a title of projects. and we'll update its icon to a folder icon. Repeat this process for the rest of the items in the nav list as shown. At this point, our code should look something like this. Before diving into the CSS, I'll minimize the live server view so we can see our progress as we continue working. For the styling, let's begin with this nav element. Let's start by giving it a fixed position so it stays anchored in place. We'll align it to the bottom of the page with bottom, 1.5 rem. Now, to center it, we'll set both left, 0 and right, 0. For the background color, we're using a soft, see-through shade with the HSLA. This gives our background a soft, frosted glass effect, which is faintly visible but doesn't cover the entire background completely. Next, let's set the width to 88%, and use margin inline, auto, to center it horizontally. To make the navigation bar look more polished, add some padding with padding, one rem on the top and bottom, two rem on the left and right, and round the edges using border radius, four rem. For that nice glass effect, 
we'll apply backdrop filter, blur of 16 pixels. And make it compatible with Safari by adding WebKit backdrop filter, blur 16 pixels. Finally, we'll set the Z index using the variable Z fixed, to ensure it stays on top of other elements. Now, let's move on to styling our nav list. We'll set display, flex to arrange the items in a row, making them sit horizontally across the navigation bar. Next, we use justify content, space between, which spaces the items out evenly, pushing the first item to the far left and the last item to the far right, with equal spacing between each item. Finally, with align items, center, we ensure that all items are aligned in the center vertically within the navigation bar, giving it a balanced and clean look. Now, let's style our navlink class. Starting with width, 2.5 rem and height, 2.5 rem, we set a consistent square size for each link, making them easy to click. The background color, transparent removes any background color, allowing the navigation bar's background to show through. For the icon color, we use color, light color, pulling in our custom light color variable. Then, with font size, 1.5 rem, we set the icon size, making it large enough to stand out clearly. Setting display, grid, allows us to use place items, center, which centers the icon perfectly within the square, both horizontally and vertically. This gives each link a clean, polished look. Next, let's set up the main section of our portfolio, assigning it the class main. Inside this, we'll create a section with the class home section and ID home. In this section, we add a div with the class home container container grid. Within this container, we'll create a div with the class profile to hold the profile image, which will have the class profile image. This image comes from the images folder and is named home prof. Below the image, we add another div with the class profile data. Inside, we'll place a heading with the class profile name for the name. Under this, we added a div with the class profile buttons that will contain a link with the class button. The first button will link to the projects section, while the second one which has an additional class btn black will link to the services section after this profile section we add another div with the class info inside we have a div with the class info data containing a div with the class info circle and a heading below with the class info name where the name remains Anna Kate. Below info data, we'll add a div with the class info image to hold an image with the class info image. This time, the image is named about prof. Under the image, we add a paragraph with the class info description for a brief description of who Anna Kate is. Finally, below the description, we have a link with the class button BTN Black that allows users to download Anna's CV, with download CV displayed on the button. Alright, now let's jump into the CSS styling for our profile section. Starting with the profile class, we're setting it up as a container for the profile content. First, we apply position, relative, which helps us position elements inside this container accurately. For the background, we're using the theme gradient variable, which will give it a smooth gradient look based on our theme's color scheme. Hold up, it looks like we need to make a quick correction in our code. Currently, we have our theme gradient written as follows. Notice there's a comma after the gradient direction, which actually breaks the syntax for this conic gradient. To fix this, we need to remove that comma, and make sure everything is properly wrapped within the parentheses. 
This small correction will make sure our gradient displays as expected. Then, we set the height to 415 pixels to give it a defined vertical space. For padding, we are adding one rem to create some inner spacing around the content. Next, we add a border radius of two rem to give the container rounded corners, creating a softer, card-like appearance. We'll set display, grid, to help position child elements easily, keeping things aligned as we add more elements inside. Finally, we add overflow, hidden, so that anything going outside the container boundaries is hidden, which can keep the layout clean if any elements overlap slightly. Now let's style the profile image, which is the profile image itself. For this, we're setting a width of 250 pixels to ensure a consistent size. We use position, absolute, to place it independently inside the profile container. Then, justify self, center, is used to center it horizontally, and align self, flex end, places it towards the bottom of the container, giving it a polished and aligned look within the profile section. Next, the profile data, which is the container for our profile name and buttons. We're positioning it towards the bottom of its container using align self, flex end. This helps keep everything aligned neatly at the bottom. For the background, we're using a soft, semi-transparent white with HSLA. This gives it that slightly frosted look, making it stand out without being too bold. We add some padding of 1.5 rem on the top and bottom and 1 rem on the sides. This adds a bit of breathing space around the elements inside. The border radius is set to 1.5 rem, giving it smooth, rounded corners. To complete the frosted look, we apply a backdrop filter blur of 5 pixels, which subtly blurs anything behind this container. We're also adding WebKit backdrop filter, blur 5 pixels. This is to ensure that the frosted effect works well across all browsers, including WebKit-based ones like Safari. Finally, add a border, of 1 pixel solid, of a color similar to the background color. Moving on to profile name. Here, we're setting the font size and style to align with the overall theme. There's a bit of space added underneath using margin bottom, 1 rem, which separates the name from the buttons, giving it a clean layout. Next, let's look at profile buttons, where we're setting up a grid layout. By using display, grid, we're creating a flexible layout to position the buttons. We set column gap, 0.5 rem, giving each button some space, so they don't sit too closely together. The grid template columns of repeat 2, 1 fr, divides the buttons into two equal columns, which is perfect for our two button setup. Now, we have our button class, which is the base style for each button. We center the text within each button with display, inline flex, and justify content, center. The background color is set to the main theme color, and the text color is set to the lighter color for contrast. We give the text a semi-bold weight, and add a padding, making the button size feel balanced. We use border radius, 2 rem for a rounded, modern look. And lastly, a transition effect on background color makes sure the color change on hover is smooth. For BTN Black, we adjust the button background to a dark color, giving this button a different style than the primary buttons. For the button on hover, we set the hover background to the accent color, creating a nice interactive effect. Now, let's finish up by refining the button padding within our profile buttons. Here, we are adjusting the padding to be a bit more compact. We set the padding to 0.75 rem on the top and bottom, and 0 on the left and right. This will make the buttons a bit slimmer vertically, giving them a more streamlined look without adding extra width. Let's move on, to the info section.
We're setting the background color to card BG color, which keeps this section consistent with our theme. Padding is added at 2 rem on the top and bottom, and 1.5 rem on the sides, creating comfortable spacing within the container. The border radius is set to 2 rem, rounding the corners for a softer look. We're also adding a subtle purple outline using RGBA, which gives gentle definition to the section. Moving on to the info circle, this element forms a small circle with a width and height of 2 rem. We're using the main color for its background, making it a standout accent. With border radius, 50%, we achieve a perfect circular shape, which can be ideal for icons or indicators. In the info name, we're styling this text to be prominent and cohesive with the rest of the design. The font is set using regular font variable, with H1 font size for a larger size, and body font variable to match the overall site typography. For info data, we're using display, flex to arrange items in a neat row. By setting justify content, center, and align items, center, everything stays centered both horizontally and vertically. The column cap of 0.5 rem provides a little spacing between items, creating a balanced look. Next, for the info image. We're adding a gradient background with our theme gradient, giving it a visually interesting backdrop. With a height of 190 pixels, it stands out as a focal point. The border radius, 2 rem, rounds the edges to align with the info container style. We're using display, grid to position inner elements easily, while overflow, hidden ensures content doesn't spill outside. In the info image, the width is set to 140 pixels to fit well within the info image container. With justify self, center, and align self, flex end, the image is centered horizontally and positioned towards the bottom. Moving to the info description. We're using the small font size variable for slightly smaller text, while margin bottom, 1 rem, adds spacing below the description text. Finally, in the info button. We're setting width, 100%, so that the button stretches across the full container, making it easy to spot and click.